I get email like this. I get messages like this. I get hate mail like this. Probably you hear this stuff from your friends, neighbors, and relatives. Oh, well, I don't know. Canada's native people, Canada's Inuit, they, they were all perfectly healthy back when they were eating a diet of absolutely nothing but meat and fish and whale blubber. It's just so convincing. And yet, it seems that nobody on either side is ever convinced. People invoke this memory of what the Inuit supposedly represent, and then they continue to eat hamburgers at McDonald's, they continue to eat factory farmed beef. Did the Inuit eat cows? Did the Inuit eat hamburgers? Like, even if you found this line of reasoning convincing, it would inspire you to reject a vegan diet, to reject a vegetarian diet, to reject a kind of moderate, science-based omnivore diet. You'd have to adopt a diet incredibly expensive and difficult to sustain. But wait, 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 let's take a step back and actually use some empirical and scientific methods. Here's the kind of greatest hits of factual arguments for the next 15 minutes from a channel you may not know called Plant Positive. This guy did a lot of work putting forward a lot of facts that are quite annoying to cobble together from good old fashioned books. It's really a great shame that his YouTube channel never did a collaboration with somebody like Mike the Vegan or other health and science-based YouTube channels. Guys, YouTube is a place where information comes to be broadcast, but it's also unfortunately a place where information comes to die. So I'm making this video partly to promote awareness of this now long forgotten YouTube channel. Shout out to Plant Positive. Da -da 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 -da. We're lucky to have this old issue of National Geographic. It has an article about the discovery of two female mummies around 440 years old, discovered near Point Barrow, far inside the Arctic Circle. If there had ever been a perfect time and place to be naturally low carb, this was it. One mummy had been in her early 40s, the other in her 20s. Just as we would expect of people living in such a hostile, frigid place, the remains showed evidence of stress. Despite their young ages, they showed evidence of atherosclerosis, a type of hardening of the arteries. They also suffered from osteoporosis, or the degradation of their bones. A painful parasitic infection was apparent as well. All this could be called the inevitable result of a diet of mostly raw animal carcasses. This is the coronary artery of an even older female mummy than the two in the National Geographic issue, in this case from around 400 AD. We see pronounced atherosclerosis. This is natural cardiovascular health the low-carb way, long before refined carbs. What we see here are effectively long-term studies of an animal-based, wise traditions diet, and the results are not pretty. We see evidence of heart disease, weak bones, and parasitic infections. Let's look at these three problems a bit more closely in Eskimos, starting with their cardiovascular disease. Early in the Paleo diet, Lauren Cordain tells us the Greenland Eskimos were exemplars of heart health, referencing the work of Bang and Dyerberg. This is a less than ideal reference for a man who argues that lower cholesterol is better. Bong and Dyerberg found that the Greenland Eskimos had what we would call today borderline high cholesterol levels. To whatever extent they may have been protected from heart attacks, Bong and Dyerberg said it was likely because of the extremely high levels of omega-3 fatty acids they consumed. They thought the price for this protection was their higher rate of stroke, which Cordain fails to mention. The myth of low cardiovascular disease among Eskimos was examined by these researchers. They found heart disease was not less common in Eskimos than in whites. Mortality from stroke was higher, however. I'll mention here that I will use the terms Eskimo and Inuit interchangeably in these videos. Those researchers also found a reliable old testimonial indicating that cardiovascular disease was actually quite common for these people. This website did the fact-checking for us. I recommend you visit it and read this blog post. I'll just borrow enough of their material here 
to show you that they certainly did not have low cholesterol, and more importantly, they had horrible life expectancy. The perspective of the authors here is that higher cholesterol is better, so obviously I don't agree with their take on this. For the Ansel Keys detractors out there, it's worth a mention that this pioneer of heart health was aware of the Eskimo diet. He was also aware of their tragically short life expectancy. Here is more evidence of heart trouble among the Eskimos. Between 1956 and 1958, the bodies of Eskimos were autopsied for this study. Hardening of the arteries was observed to be quite common. More recently, a large cohort of Eskimos were studied. Despite favorable lipid profiles, rates of stroke and cardiovascular disease were high. Notice they carried a high pathogen burden. That brings us to another problem created by their traditional diet. Parasitic infections. Eskimos certainly had them. Here you see a 1950 record of the prevalence of intestinal parasites among them. This is inevitable if you are routinely consuming raw, untreated fish and meat. These parasites would have had the effect of lowering their blood cholesterol. Doctors Eaton and Cordain should have clued you in on this, don't you think? Circumpolar natives had high infection rates of one notorious parasite, Toxoplasma. The Inuit were the most afflicted group in this study, with 72% of their pregnant women infected. What about the osteoporosis observed in those Eskimo mummies? This paleopathologist attributed that to their high-protein diet. Extreme protein intake is fingered for blame here as well. Bone mineral content in Eskimos was assessed as deficient in a 1974 study. The Eskimos compared poorly to whites, who presumably were eating a lot more carbs than the Eskimos were. So is their high protein intake really the best explanation for their weak bones? There are conflicting studies regarding the effects of high protein diets on bone health. However, the evidence is more clear that dietary saturated fat is highly damaging to bones. This has been demonstrated through animal experimentation. Eskimos are a curious choice of dietary model for paleo dieters and crossfitters. It is in the interest of those in cold climates to have more insulating body fat. Eskimos were long ago considered unusually short and overweight. They were not considered to be physically strong either. They were observed to age poorly as well. This is usually not an openly stated goal for fad diets. Descriptions of Eskimos from the 19th century can be uncomfortable to read. These unflattering descriptions wouldn't be worth reviewing if Eskimos weren't presented as a model for us today. Traditional Eskimos had other health problems as well. They have been afflicted by some cancers, for example. A century ago, reports stated otherwise, but they were later shown to be inaccurate. Any observed low occurrence of cancer soon was understood to be only the result of infectious diseases, which ended their lives before cancers had a chance to develop. Eskimos actually have some of the world's highest rates of certain cancers. Here is a graph for that. A cancer was also identified in the remains of an extinct paleo-Eskimo. Perhaps some of that can be explained by the toxins in their food supply. Eating such fatty food so far up the food chain is bound to convey environmental contaminants into these people. Inuit milk contained up to 10 times the level of persistent organochlorine compounds as found in the milk of women in Quebec. These authors say Inuit women have the highest known body burdens of these pollutants. More evidence that Eskimos of the old days aren't ideal models for health comes from this doctor's account from 1935 of his services to them. This is sometimes referenced to argue that they were especially healthy, but such a reading requires ignoring some key passages. In this one, children were said to frequently die after eating meat that had begun to spoil. He said Eskimos also commonly suffered from appendicitis. Eskimos called this rotten guts. Higher rates of appendicitis in other cultures have been linked to increased meat eating. My final slide for the Eskimos brings us back to our mummies. Here you see that all those omega-3 fatty acids don't seem to help Eskimos keep plaque out of their arteries. For the Eskimos, just like everyone else, saturated fat causes atherosclerosis. Here is Lauren Cordain claiming that the Inuit had a low rate of coronary disease as verified by autopsy studies. Remember, he thought there could be a meat-based non-atherogenic diet.
One reference here to support his claim is Gottman 1960. This reference was also put forth by some of the original paleo diet promoters, Boyd Eaton and Melvin Connor. Rather than take their word for it, let's look at the actual paper. As you see, Gottman is the author. Did Cordain not see the passage on the right? Gottman says there was a 40-year-old woman with calcified arteries. Forty is way too young for such a thing, Dr. Cordain. Where do you get your low standards? This calcification is what happens during heart disease. Gottman also mentioned a 41-year-old man who suffered a stroke due to plaque formation, and he too had diseased arteries. 41 isn't old to me, Dr. Cordain. Would Gottman have guessed that his paper would be used one day to say that these people were unusually healthy? Did Cordain not see his statement that the conclusion of this author is that cardiovascular disease of an arteriosclerotic type is not uncommon among the Eskimos or Indians in Alaska? I am continually astounded by the misrepresentation of the old research by these imaginative low-carbers. Gottman remarked that the bodies he autopsied tended to be quite young. Only 5% were over 50 years old. Most were under 20. You can imagine how tough life must have been for them back then. Another reference Cordain used to support his claim of a low rate of heart disease among the Inuit was Beauregard and Dyerberg, which is on the fifth line down. This one also found a high rate of stroke. Like Gottman, these authors cautioned that their research shouldn't be overinterpreted. The validity of Greenlandic mortality statistics is not high, they said. We have yet more weak data and yet another weak reference. Can you believe the low carbers think these studies are worth more than the China study? These authors were quite clear that they thought the marine diet of these Inuit caused a shift in risk away from heart disease and toward strokes. This study is an especially odd choice for Cordain because it so directly contradicts his paper and his beliefs. The authors say clearly that any impression of a lower rate of ischemic heart disease among these Inuit does not give a correct picture because they die at such high rates from other things. In other words, other things happened to kill them first before heart disease could get its chance. But that isn't the best part here. You see that their mortality from heart disease had actually declined as they left their paleo lifestyle and lived in towns, eating non-paleo foods. Dr. Cordain is not a cardiologist. That is probably why he doesn't think cholesterol scores in the 300 to 400 range at the high end are especially high. I can assure you, however, that that is high cholesterol. Mean cholesterol for all men over 20 was above 200. They definitely aren't relatively low compared to vegans. Inuit cholesterol was found to be higher than what was seen in the United States. And remember, the United States was having a major problem with coronary disease then. In 1990, a study was done comparing native Greenlanders to Danes to try to account for the lower reported rates of heart disease among the Greenlanders. Using ultrasonography, they found that they had almost the same degree of atherosclerosis as the Danes. They stated that atherosclerosis was probably generally present among these Inuit to a similar extent as for Caucasians. They did find it plausible that there might be a factor in their diets which may have lowered their rate of infarction. You now know this was likely due to their high fish consumption, which also probably contributed to their higher rate of stroke. All that fish consumption also explains why their bodily toxin burdens were high. In this study, one of the main predictors of high bodily contaminant concentrations was their markers of omega-3 fatty acids from fish. More fish, more toxins was the finding here. Here, a detailed examination was conducted of several other mummies. 
These dated from around 1475. Thanks to fortuitous discoveries like this, I can inform you about the preserved bodies of people who lived in environments as carbohydrate-free as is naturally possible. They were not eating any grains or beans. Here you see at the top left that arterial plaque was found in one mummy. He also had very weak bones, a common theme for these old mummies. Their diet seemed to have been very damaging to their bone health. On the right, you can see that a child was also found to have poor bone quality, as well as possible birth defects. At the top, you can see that their high-protein diets led to the development of a kidney stone in one mummy. Again, their lives must have been quite hard. I hear that kidney stones are awful. On the right, you can see that this paleopathologist was certain he discovered evidence of a malignant cancer in one body. He said that this form of cancer was also common in modern times among circumpolar peoples. With all that said, I will affirm for the Weston Price Foundation fans that they had no tooth decay, if that happens to be your highest health priority. Poor bone status has been observed among these people in more recent times. These researchers blame their poor bone health on their high-protein, low-calcium diets. These researchers thought a comparison with vegetarians was appropriate as well, remarking that vegetarians seem to have better bone health than omnivores. When you put all this together, I don't think the take-home message should be that these people were or are in any way way lesser than anyone else. Historic circumpolar peoples were challenged in life in ways that very few of us are today. Their survival alone is to be admired. My point here is that there is no reason to look to them as models of good health for us. Dun, 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 dun.